What's up? It's your one and only Johnny OJ. Welcome to another beautiful episode of It Is What It Is with Johnny. How you guys doing? Waity the happy, waity the waity the shelle, naughty the bad. Hi guys, what's up? What's happening? Happy Sunday to each and every one of you. Today is the last Sunday of the month of June. Today is the second to the last day. No, third to the last day to the month of June. Like, come on, six months. Six months is gone. We have six months to wrap up 2020. It is what it is. So our topic for today is the state of the nation. The state of the nation. And I just want to briefly talk about our guest for today. Nobody but Omoyele Showere. If you know me well or if you know Omoyele Showere. Showere happens to be um 2019 former presidential candidate and he's also the founder and ceo of sahara reporters sahara reporters so we will be talking and we'll be having the conversation but he will be asking so many questions as regards to the fact that our topic for today is the state of the nation uh good evening mr shore how are you doing today good evening i'm good yeah nice one uh how's your day been happy happy sunday to you over there <laughs> oh yes uh it's been all right okay okay so what did you do today oh uh you know i, I don't know what i did today honestly so i do a lot of things every day oh a lot of things so every day <laughs> i can't pinpoint exactly what it is i what it is oh, i okay. did so Outstanding, uh, like you said, is what I do today. Every day I do so many things. I okay. do a little bit of everything. Okay, okay, that's nice. That's nice. Welcome to our show. It is what it is with Johnny. Our last show for the month of June, and today there's one thing you're going to do for sure. You're going to talk. <laughs> so speaking of which, so can you share with us your earliest childhood experience as as a growing up young Ijoa poor boy? Oh, well, you know, I, uh, what is most remarkable about my growing up is, uh, well, I, I'm, a, I'm the first child of uh, my parents. Oh, you're uh, first? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I grew up pretty quickly because I had to take care of my siblings. Yeah. So by the age of nine, I had become a full fledged fisherman. So Ooh, I was fishing by the age. Yeah, I was going fishing and going to school yeah. at the same time. So I have to go fishing after school hours. And then, then I go the next morning to go cash, you know, to take home the cash. Yeah. And then I have to take my shower, or, you know, I have to bathe at the lake. Uh, okay. And then go to school as soon as I get home. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. So that's what I did for most of my you know between I, I think between the age of maybe seven and uh on up until i left the village i was actively fishing so you were uh, fishing I went to at the same time. Yeah. okay that's well that's very interesting that's so that means your drive for leadership has always been there because you happen to be the first head of your of your of your family uh, i think part of it was uh destiny and okay. fate. That's the fate of the first child, you know. I remember in those days, even when I got to the university, uh, and um, I would, when I when I when I first met uh, a friend, lady friend, and okay. I was explaining myself and thought it was a good thing to say I was first born, and she asked how many kids your parents have, and yeah. I said at that point we were about um, at that point I think we were about fourteen or so. I mean. At that point, I think we were about 16. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that was the last I heard from her because, you know, and I asked my friend, what happened to this lady? She never called me back because she never want to talk to me again. He said, well, she already <laughs> seen you as a major liability. You know, you're going to have to carry the liability of all your siblings. She doesn't want to be part of that. Oh. So, so I was advised never to introduce myself as a first child or first oh. son ever again to a female. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. Okay, luckily for me, I happen to be the last child of the female. And my own side of it is that I'm mommy's boy. So I, I never yeah. introduced myself as the last child of the family. People are going to like you because you get all the support from your, you know, all the yeah, right. parents. 
you yeah. are likely to be spoiled too. It is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, so so heading to another interesting question is that speaking about your participation in student union unionism, especially the school you finished from um, Unilag, how has that served as an inspiration in youth empowerment in court? You know, I think I had this conversation with you personally before. I don't know how to address the issue of youth empowerment. It's, yeah. It sounds so, such, I mean, churchy to me, you know. And it's yeah. like when government lies to people, youth empowerment, it's become yeah. a buzzword for where you just want to make youth or young people feel good, you know. Yeah. But, you know, in my view, so the unionism was uh, the ultimate power in those days. We were empowering the public. We were the source of power for people who were abused, people who had been cheated, uh, yeah. people who had been oppressed in society. Okay. We were the fulcrum. We fought for everybody and anybody. And we fought, we fought against a lot of people as students. Okay. Uh, it was interesting was that uh, when we were in primary school and secondary school, in those days, they see the, in those days that uh, they used to teach history, we were taught about all these characters. Uh, they were like uh, liberators, you know, great people. When we got to the university, we had to fight the same people. We discovered okay. that they had manipulated history, social studies, and government yeah. uh, to respect what was not the truth. So, uh, so we we were the sort of empowerment. Uh, when people use empowerment, it's just, I feel like it's being it's yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, reflecting on your participation in student unionism, especially the 1990s, what's the difference of that era and this current era of student Oh, there's no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no even any way to compare it. There's no basis for comparison. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a period of courage. It was a period of patriotism. It was a period of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I mean, we put our lives on the line. States. We will go out to protest against military, uh, police, military, uh, crazy military people out there on the street, police, DSS, and we didn't care. These days, everybody is looking to get paid. You know, everybody is uh, looking to get paid. Everybody's trying all, to survive. All student to leaders, actually. Yeah. The people who call themselves student leaders today are like mercenaries. They're out there mm -hmm. just looking to get whatever they can from whatever system is out there that suits their agenda. So that's why they have no real uh, positive political purpose or even social purpose to them in the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no way I can compare myself. Sorry, compare that period with uh, this period. We were running student union governments those days. Uh, today we have student union hustlers. It's, uh, people hustling for money, you know, offering awards to people who don't deserve them, uh, serving as uh, pawns and puppets to uh, the corrupt system of government in the country. So we're, it was a different time and. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't make the comparison or something. I, I can't. I haven't found it yet, and I'm not yeah, saying. Can. I can't. I'm not saying it to brag. It's just. Yeah. It's, it's the reality. It's the reality. All right. It's all, all right. So, do you think it could change after this COVID nineteen? Because everybody, this COVID nineteen has served as an eye opener to all sectors and industries. We hope so. Uh, and uh, but we don't, I don't, I don't, we haven't, I haven't seen that yet. Because if things are going to change, you're going to see the signs now. I haven't seen any signs of, uh, you know, any changes that might come that will make me feel like, yeah, we're going to see a different mindset, different attitude, and a different way of uh, engaging and interacting for ourselves and the interests of ourselves against oppression. All I just see is people still doing the same thing, uh, complaining and whining, uh, agonizing, 
I haven't seen any level of organizing yet. That gives me the kind of hope that uh, you want me to talk about. So, what's what's your opinion? What's your what's your ideology of better organizing? Uh, how this can be better handled by by world leaders? It's, it's, it's a it's a function of you know very young you know I, I, I would say idealistic people who know what oppression is who want a better society standing up courageously to organize their peers friends and to be positive influence on others to say look you know we got to get together and fight this and do so and just replicate these cells all across the country so when you're hearing about Black Lives Matter, they just didn't happen overnight. You know, they happen, and Black Lives Matter uh, was organized by young people. In fact, mm -hmm. one of the ladies uh, who is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Opa Tometi, is a Nigerian. Ooh. Yes. Opa Tometi. Hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. She's a Nigerian. She's, uh, I think, one of her parents is, uh, is Nigerian. So, but nobody remembers that. People are more interested in um, the guy who was one of the killers of George Floyd, whose mother said the father ran away, and mm -hmm. the father is Nigerian. But one of the persons who co-founded Black Lives Matter, part of is a Nigerian. So you can imagine, it's, there's nothing, there's no rocket science to organize them. But look at what Black Lives Matter has done all over the world. It's not in the U.S., it has taken on the system of oppression and discrimination around the world and torn it apart mm -hmm. and exposed it. The underbelly of racism has been turned upside down by just a few young people. And I'm, that's, that's what I'm answering this question so that you can understand that it's possible here and that the new Nigeria or a different Nigeria is possible. You just need you guys, people like you and your friends that you talk to, every day, uh, thousands of you, to listen to the right channels uh, and not listen to fluff and distraction and live your life according to fluff and distraction because then when you get old, you have no country to call your own. So that's, that's a very, very important uh, factor in all of this. Okay, so like, like mentioning about the Black Lives Matter and how they protested, because only the Black Lives Matter protest was able to expose racism and expose the likes of police brutality. Is that what your revolution looks like? I'm just asking out of curiosity. No, it's bigger than that. You see, I want to quote uh, Noam Chomsky. Mm -hmm. uh, briefly, Nashovsky is uh, one of the better philosophers and writers and uh, you know, left, leftist uh, in the world today is based in the U.S. You know, he said, the system of revolution, so that people can understand, is a system that kicks in when you understand that ordinary reforms, you know, regular reforms cannot mm -hmm. solve your problems. So, for example, in Nigeria, people talk about electoral reforms. So, haven't we reached a point where we understand already that the current leaders in Nigeria cannot reform themselves? They can't reform the system. Because this is a system they set up for their own agenda, their own interest. So, when you get to that period and the oppressive machine in the country is weighing down you such that you can't make progress, you can't continue to relate with it uh, in a manner that uh, gives you the ultimate belief and understanding or even the hope that you can have a better future for yourself or your kids or generations to come. That's what revolution is about. That, you know, when you're tired of oppression, you say enough is enough and uh, you dismantle the system of oppression, the system that uh, promotes and creates, I mean, that creates and promotes poverty, the system that uh, destroys your health, the system that destroys your educational system, the corrupt, the incompetent, and the wicked system that has kept Nigeria the way it is today. And everybody is, in my view, in agreement with me that the system is not working. So what do you do about it? Some of you might decide that, you know, you don't want to engage the system because you're afraid. 
But some of us might say, well, we're not afraid. We want to take on the system headlong and uh, ensure that we keep fighting on the system is finally and permanently dismantled. That's what the revolution is about. That's what your revolution is all about. Yeah. Tiger is a record that the at least would, would, everybody should know what the revolution is all no, about. No, you know, like I don't even I don't try to pay attention to when people ask me define revolution. I don't I don't waste my time on it. I ask them, are you are you satisfied with the life you're living? I said no. Then you are interested in the revolution. You just okay, don't know so, it. <laughs> so what if I'm satisfied with the life I'm living? Uh, well, because there, uh, if you are, are people out you here. are probably just less than one percent of uh, the population of Nigeria, and you know, if you are, then it doesn't mean that others are. Those who are not satisfied with the life they are living must dismantle a system that keeps them oppressed, poor, you know, and without dignity. Without dignity, without dignity. Okay, I'll hold you. I'll hold you on that. So I was, while I was like researching, I just playing with my phone, I saw something on the internet. I think um, the World Health Organization commended Nigeria, Nigeria's effort in containing these, this virus. What's, what's your take on that? Uh, you've got to check the date on that particular uh, okay. commendation. Is, uh, I, mean, I don't work with the World Health Organization. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm actually not a big fan of all these international groups and organizations okay. and the way they conduct themselves. There are the same people at uh, the United Nations who will come here, see that the election is totally rigged, and they write a report that the elections are free and fair. So I, I don't respect them. You know, the IMF uh, and the World Bank are the same multilateral organizations that destroyed our economy the way it is today through the structural adjustment program and the bogus loans that they offer to thieves who are running our countries. So I don't, uh, if, if who said that, that's the World Health Organization, uh, WHO, I'd be shocked, but I won't be surprised. You know. I'll try and I'll, I'll do my research. I just saw it and I'll like, pick it, people, I just have to pick it up. So, like speaking, speaking of that, now currently the trends of the, the more like plethora challenges we're facing in Nigeria, one of them happens to um, be sexual violence. And my guest, I had a guest on my show, Anita Oka, 2018, most beautiful girl in Nigeria. She said something about lapse of time on rape, reporting rape. So, what's your What's your suggestion of, of the subject matter? Oh, man, it's, uh, it's become a pandemic. And it should be declared as such. There should be a rape emergency in Nigeria at this point. Uh, not only uh, adults getting raped, babies are getting raped. And when you get to that point in a country where people are so bestial that they engage in such uh, cannibalistic, I'll call it cannibalism, uh, mm -hmm. Those things are, we have to declare an emergency and appropriately deal with the issue with the urgency and the severity it demands. And okay. but that requires leadership. And at this time, we don't have leaders who can do anything. Okay, yeah. okay let me. Let so, me everybody is just out there, you know, okay. saying what they think should be done, but there's no one to implement it. Yeah, every, everyone has a point to say, but we are sh we are running short of people to implement it. So uh, there's a question here from uh, King Fablo. I'm going to respond to your, your question. There's a question here. My question is anonymous. My question is, how do we have one Nigeria when there's another activist with a considerable audience in Anambikano asking for a breakout of the failed system? That's Biafra. That's the question. Yeah. No, no. It's, uh, look, the, the Biafran struggle is a struggle that emanated from a system of injustice that lasted for a long time. Like, okay. So many of you were not around when the civil war was fought. I wasn't around. I was born uh, a year after yes. the civil war. Yeah. Yes. And, but I've read, studied, and heard about the civil war so much that I cannot wave aside the grudge of the Biafran, uh, Biafrans, 
And to know that the same, if you go and read the history of the Civil War today, you read any literature on it, it's the same mentality that led to the war that is now prevailing today, the bigotry, the lack of respect for diversity, diversity the divisiveness, and the absolute disregard for human rights. So, you know, you kill, they started with the pogrom, you know, and then led to civil war, but three million people killed with all kinds of, you know, either you're killed directly by a soldier shooting at you, or through some kind of policy of starvation, of which all Nigerian leaders were guilty, leaders of that time, regardless of where they came from. So that doesn't mean that Nigeria cannot be one, but Nigeria cannot be a, a, cannot be a united entity, you know, you know, with the help of injustice. You can't use force, you know, to make people part of Nigeria. You can only use justice to bring people to Nigeria. And that is absent right now. And people are agitating. It's not only Namdi Khan. I've been quoted several times of saying this. Namdi Khan who is agitating for the separation of Biafra as a, as a group, as a group entity. A lot of us, you, me, millions of young people, are also agitating for, you know, for separation from Nigeria, mentally. A lot of us have left Nigeria, just that we are trapped here. So a lot of people have seceded from Nigeria. A lot of people don't have anything to do with Nigeria anymore. They just live in Nigeria as a geographical entity. And let me explain it to you in a very simple way. If you have to provide education for your kids, electricity for your house, water for, for you to drink and wash, if you have to provide your own doctor, sometimes you have to construct your own road. Are you still in Nigeria? You know, every, every house is like a local government. You have to provide your own security. You ever have to provide your schools, you know. You have to invent your own God. So a lot of people are no longer living here. But the Biafran struggle is more potent because it has a flag, it has an identity, and it's a very strong... Uh, and potent uh, grudge against the Nigerian state or the Nigerian nation as it is now. So you can't, you can't just wave it away. But if there's justice, if you have leaders today in this country that know what is right, and not clamping people into jail or massacring people because they have religious differences like they did with the Shiites, uh, the Bia friends or our Southeastern brothers will come back They'll be happy. In fact, in the United Nigeria, the Biafrans are likely to do better because they're business people. Abuja is how many kilometers away from the southeast? Go to some of the biggest estates in, in Nigeria, in these Abuja that we're in. They are owned by southeasterners. They're doing well. They're business people. They're manufacturing. But they are doing all of this. You don't give them a chance uh, in position of authority. You don't construct roads in the own part of the world. You call them names. You have official policies that outrightly discriminate against them. You have unofficial policies that denigrate them. You don't expect them to stay together with you forever. And when they say to you that they want restructuring or they want to break away, you don't call them and say, hey, let's have a conversation. You send soldiers to go and kill them and you call it operation crocodile tears or, you know, whatever oppression you call them. I mean, who wants to live in a country that sends soldiers to kill peaceful citizens, peaceful agitators? Nobody wants to live in, those, in that kind of a country. America killed just one black guy. Just one police officer killed one black guy. Look at what is happening, right? In the whole world, the whole world is shaking. Everybody's protesting. If that happened to IPOP people, We'll take it for granted. Oh, they're troublemakers. Yes, maybe they taunt the soldiers. You know. So, this, so you get my point, right? You can't okay, force I, 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 I get where you're like, coming from. So, are you saying like a bad Nigeria is like a Nigeria is like a bad marriage? You know, you can't keep <laughs> asking the abused wife to remain in the marriage, and every day she comes between black and blue, and you want them to remain there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, Nigeria is the bad marriage. I hope Nigeria becomes a good marriage. 
I don't want yeah. to be yeah. married. I better marry. We can so make you. We of, can make it good. You know, if we, if we, if we get Nigeria a different husband. <laughs> so, are you the husband? Are we anticipating you as the future husband of Nigeria? Well, you know, I don't want to use that. That's not the best way to use it because the terminology <laughs> "husband" is yeah. some kind of. Uh, you know, it's it it it's, it it may, makes me feel like you know I'm talking about superiority of man over woman, and I don't believe okay. that. So, so uh, I, I don't want leadership. To, we are done with this patriarchal society that put us in the mess that we're in today, because uh, okay. ninety nine percent of our problems were caused by men, husbands, apparently, fathers, okay. people who are supposed to be responsible who are not. Okay, let me let me hold you let me hold you that from there. Husbands, men, patriarchal system. So, yes. how will you? How will you? Uh, what are your observations, your comments on women's participation in politics? Now, one thing is women participating. Another thing is their opinions being administered, being uh, embraced as policies. Women in the national assembly, state house of assembly, ministerial appointment, whatsoever. Are they stereotyped to just? Uh, Helping refugees, motherless babies home, or something like that. So we, we need to we need to know women's involvement. Women women are very involved in politics in Nigeria, but the question is, do we think women are humans? Do we treat them as equals? We don't. The president of Nigeria once said it in the UK that uh, his wife, who had come out to speak loudly about what is wrong with the government, belongs in the kitchen. You know, that's the that's practically the official national policy of Nigeria and women. You know, that's why we have a, a ministry of women affairs, right? Because we think women are so inferior, they need a ministry. You know, and I'm still looking for the ministry of men affairs. I haven't found one. So why don't we have a ministry of men affairs? Because we feel men are superior to women. So we just give them one ministry. And whenever there is political events, you know, just buy them rappers, let them dance, and when decision making is to happen, you shove the women out and you bring in all the men, and then you allow one woman into the place, and her title is called woman leader. And who is the man's leader in that meeting? I don't know. It's because even the political parties, all of us, have so imbibed the culture of oppression of women that we call women. We, we invite women and say, oh, you know, it's the woman leader of our party, and they clap for her. Because her opinion doesn't count. She belongs, to, uh, she's a minority in the decision-making process even in political affairs. How, how, how so, involved are women your, your your party? No, yeah, the, the women are very involved in our party. We just had the, the primary election in uh, those states. The person who emerged defeated a guy. So our, the AAC party in those states produced a female candidate. And if uh, everything goes right, as we expect, it will be the first female governor in Nigeria. But we just hope that women also will vote for, you know, a bright woman like that. Because they keep voting for men that keep failing them and their children and their families. We should stop that. So, so to the extent that that question is how involved are women, I just told you in know, Adoste we just produced a female candidate for AAC. And she's going to slug it out with all the lazy men in APC and PDP. Okay, okay, okay. Congratulations to, to the member of your party as well. I will send my congrats to her. So speaking of which, I have an interesting question which talks about fraud has been the baby of corruption that has served as a stigma um, in the name of Nigeria, to our country, Nigeria. So what do you have to say of uh, whether people who are involved in fraud or something, the likes of Invictus, the likes of Hush Puppy. These are people youths used to look up to, like, oh, I want to blow, I want to, you understand, have the Gucci's and all of that, without the youths it's, knowing the source of their income. So you what know, do you have to say? The likes of Hush Puppy are babies. These are baby fraud stars. You know, they're just a symbol of a minute part of the fraud that happens in Nigeria. The daddies of fraud, you know, yeah? they are the governors of states, presidents, members of National Assembly, 
members of, uh, yes, National Assembly, both lower and the upper echelon of National Assembly, ministers, permanent, uh, permanent secretaries in the ministries. In this Abuja, some of them own up to 50 houses, 100 houses. You know, Hop, Hop Daddy, sorry, Hush Puppy. Oh. Hush Puppy yes. is just a flamboyant, small-time crook. You know, compared to the Hush Daddies in Nigeria, who have been stealing since I was born. You know, so, so what, what kind, what, I'm not what happened, yeah. saying that Hush Puppy mm -hmm. is uh, uh, a good example of uh, what the citizens should be. I'm just saying that, you know, in over-celebrating the arrest of Hush Puppy, we should not forget the, his grandfathers and fathers in Nigeria's political system who are greater fraud stars than Hush Puppy. Some of them are even uh, are friends with uh, Hush Puppy. They take pictures with him uh, all the time. They go to his house. They all hang out together. So yeah, there's, why there's you know, one about... Hush Puppy are not talking about the Hush Daddies? <laughs> Uh, and the, uh, but you say Bob Daddy, Bob Daddies. That means that means yeah, I you say have some. Daddies. I say Hush Daddies. I call them Hush Daddies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do. I was just trying to crack you up. Uh, Hush but... Daddies, as uh, as they're called. <laughs> you know, whichever way you want to call them. I'm just saying, like, and I'm not in any way trying to play down on what Hush Puppy did. I'm just saying that you know we cannot talk about fraud. Hush Hush Puppy did not, you know, drop from the sky. You know, he watched some people still, still, still had no consequences, and he felt that it's, uh, it's, it's good to glorify fraud because we have been glorifying fraud in this country by worshiping the Hush Daddies. You know, uh, we have them in Lagos, we have them in Abuja, we have in Adamawa, we have in Port Harcourt. A lot of these guys, they don't even hide it, you know. In, they, they are as uh, glutinous as. Uh, uh, Hush, uh, Hush Puppy. The other day, some guys put a picture of uh, Dangote and Hush, uh, Hush Puppy and said, this one works for his money. Hush, Hush Puppy doesn't work for his own money. I'm laughing at them because you don't know how Dangote made his money. Some of the things Dangote did to make money is probably worse than what uh, Hush Puppy did. Okay. But because so they're me... able to sanitize their words, you know, you think that... He can just say, well, because he's the richest man in Africa. The richest woman in Africa is the daughter of uh, the Santos in Angola. She's a thief. So, we I have hope, to just I, make sure I, I that we balance you have... it properly, contextually, hope... so that we don't get it wrong by okay. making it look like, oh, you know, yes, we feel good about what happened to Hush Puppy because he's flamboyant and showing off cars on uh, Instagram. What about the thieves who are not on Instagram? And that those ones are the ones I'm interested in. Because if you can take care of those ones, there will never be a hush puppy in this country anytime soon. But without taking uh -oh. care of them, the hush daddies will be giving birth to new hush puppies. Okay. You've said a lot with that, and I hope you have credible authenticities for... Uh, I warned you things. before you brought me on your show that I don't... <laughs> can't stop me from saying my mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it yeah. is what it is. But I'm, uh, I'm a political, I'm a physical and political entity. And there's okay. nothing I'm saying here that I'll say anywhere. And, uh, and, you know, I can take on anybody who might have questions. They're free to okay. contact me. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I have this one. Uh, so we, we saw what happened to Judge Floyd in the U.S. It was trending. It actually gave a spark to the whole world. So um, in application to the Nigeria police force, do you have suggestions how the Nigeria police can control or carry out that this is better than what it is today? I don't have any suggestions without replacing the leadership of the country. That has to happen first because the police force reflects the commander-in-chief of uh, the armed forces. The police force is part of the armed forces in the country. You know, so it is the commander in chief who chooses the uh, the inspector general of the police. So, if the mindset of uh, the commander in chief is that of a torturer, someone who has no respect for human rights, the IGP will be the same. So, and our police is uh, undergone so much uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, terrible image, terrible conduct that it needs. 
or you need a lot of overhaul. We need to overhaul our police completely. So without doing that, and including fixing their condition of service, including fixing where they work. Because if you've been to the police station before, I go there frequently because uh, I'm a serial offender of uh, the states. You know, I'm, um, I'm an enemy of the states, quote and unquote. You look at where police officers work, you understand why some of them behave like animals. You know, I mean, how do you have a police force where, you know, the best paid policeman is earning 56,000 naira and you expect him to face criminals, some of them who are billionaires. You have to fix the police force, you have to fix condition of service, you have to fix training, you know, and you have to fix character. So, because uh, a country is as good as, uh, you know, the country's police are good as uh, the country and its leadership. Or vice versa. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that. So, you've said lots of interesting stuff. Uh, out of curiosity, I want to ask you, what kind of role models did you have growing up? What kind of people did you look up to growing up? I, see, the, way, the way I would describe my role models is a little bit of everything. There's no perfect person, just like myself, I'm not perfect. Hello? Yeah. yeah, I'm with you. So, is the reason I... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear loud and clear? Nobody, so, my role models are a little bit of everything. You know, when I was growing up, there was a part of me that loved Muhammad Ali. You know, Yay. part of me that liked Nelson Mandela. You okay. know, there was a part of me that liked Fela Kuti, you know, uh, Robert Nesta Mali, Bob Mali. So... It's just, uh, you know, and I had local heroes. I had people in the village I like, like my dad's brother who was a teacher. I like my dad too, but, you know, it's a part of me that likes some part of my dad's uh, lifestyle. The fact that he's hardworking as a teacher and uh, dedicated his life to raising some quality kids. You know, there's some part of me that uh, like one of my secondary school teachers, I mean, primary school teachers, you know, uh, who inspired me to, you know, do so well in primary school that uh, I left primary four instead of going to primary six to go to secondary school. Yeah, so uh, I don't even know where he is, but he was my hero. I looked up to him every day. Because of him, I want to go to class. I want to go to school every day. So it's just a little bit of everything. You know, it's a part of me that I like my mom because uh, she was just a very cool person. Uh, we didn't used to disagree a lot when I was doing that. <laughs> that's why she's, and, that's why she's and very because, cool. And because wow. she gave me my first, because she gave me my first job. All right, there you go. She had a little kiosk in the village and made me the manager of the kiosk. So, manager, what, 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 what were you guys probably selling? What was the trade? <laughs> yeah, my mom was selling like cigarettes. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. I'm telling you, selling soap. Secrets. Uh, yeah, she's so selling bread. Later, we were selling eggs. You know, it was like a local, local grocery store in you know, like Bodega. And Why was this secret you called first? Selling, uh, we were also selling alcohol, Gogoro, like local brew alcohol. So, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's interesting. And then candies, that's... you know, all kinds of... Uh, we were selling a little bit of medicine, too. Like, okay. you know, like medicine, yeah. So, so if you find, so it was in the, it was in the center of the village, and my mom made me the manager. And I, it felt so cool to be uh, a store manager, like a kiosk manager. So, so someone is actually were were you guys also selling cannabis? <laughs> no, I, we weren't selling cannabis. Uh, it was legal to sell cannabis. If uh, if I could, I would, I would have sold cannabis. You know, I if you could, yeah. yeah what else? So younger, I'd always, okay. I'd always. I was I was I was selling cigarettes, right? And I knew that cigarettes was kill, killing people. And I knew the guys who were who were, who were smoking cannabis in the village. They were healthier than the guys selling. I mean, smoking cigarettes. So I knew since I was young, very young, that cannabis was healthier. In fact, that okay. it, it had health benefits than cigarettes. I was I was selling cigarettes as as young as nine year old kid, eight year old kid. Okay. In my mom's store, and I know the Eight, people buy nine. cigarettes. Yes, I was, I was, I was the manager. Oh, you grew, you grew up too fast, man. I grew up, yeah. I, I had to do so many things. 
So I was the manager of the store, and the people buying cigarettes and smoking cigarettes would come back with cough. You know, they're always sick, and they'll buy more cigarettes and candies, and they'll buy cola nuts. But the guys who we weren't selling cannabis to, it was just in one part of town. People would call them all kinds of names. They never, they never fall sick. Come on, man. They work very hard. Yeah. Come on. Wait, Mr. Show, wait. Quick one. Do you have a nickname? <laughs> because yes, you should, I did. You I should have a nickname doing all these things. Born, Can you just give me like... When I, was, when I was born, I was very popular. I had like several names, you know. Yeah, so I say you were popular. Stuck, yeah, the one that stuck with me was uh, Pullman, you know. Because when Pullman. I Pullman. Yeah, yes. Because, because of I, your fishing history. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't fishy. But then when I was a baby, my, I was born in my mom's, uh, with my mom's parents. And okay. when I came over to, when they brought me to my dad's village, everybody just kept moving me around from one person to the other. And, you know, and I'll pull, you know, I'll, I'll pull, I'm always pulling my hand and just very cool. I never cry. You know, people love cool me. Man. Yeah, so, but, you know, Knowing our people, they changed it to everybody because they couldn't pronounce the word Puluma, and they called me Puluma. So, Puluma. It my, yes, it was my nickname for a long time. Yeah, oh, Puluma. Can I call you Puluma? Okay. Puluma. So, yeah. Mama Puluma. Can I call yes. you Puluma for the rest of the show? <laughs> I like it. Probably no, but I don't like the name anymore. So, if you call me by nickname now, you gotta pay for it. Oh, for oh. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. I ain't gonna do that. It is what but it that is. Was man. A, that was my nickname. But when I was in secondary school, you know, uh, I was caught smoking cigarettes. You know, so uh, so my classmates used to call me uh, Saint Maurice because I was caught smoking cigarette. Yes. For real? Yeah. I was, oh, I was you have some bad habits, man. To, so let me tell you the story. I was going to Freshwater. And right. uh, one old guy, the old people don't finish their cigarettes. And I always wanted to smoke cigarettes. So, I, had my, so I, I picked up the cigarette and I put, my, I put my, uh, my bucket over my head and I was smoking and moving and thinking that nobody saw me. But this, the smoke was coming out as if I was at caught fire. So okay. one of my older classmates came and removed the bucket from my head and you know all this smoke just came out and everybody was like it was a small village it was like wow this child is smoking cigarette oh like, man of myself and for a long time uh, my classmates were calling me said Maurice and I didn't Seth like Maurice. Yeah. Seth that Maurice that was the that was the, that was the butt of cigarette that, was... that I was caught with St. Maurice yes. oh uh, St. Maurice of those days right <laughs> Yeah, I know it. <laughs> pretty crazy. Uh, of course, it was last time I tried a uh, cigarette. And contrary to what people think, I've never smoked uh, cannabis before. Never. You've never smoked never cannabis tried. before? So never. this is an interesting one. For instance, if there's a bill of legal, like legalizing weed or marijuana, will you be against it? I'll support it. I've said it openly. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. See, people don't understand that um, it's the, part of marijuana that, the, the part of marijuana that people are afraid of is just a small percentage of it. Marijuana is a, you know, is a, is, is a cash crop, right? Even better cash than cocoa and timber and all of them combined together. It's easy to grow it. Uh, in the U.S., just one state, Colorado, makes a billion dollars. Colorado, yeah, I heard about that. From legalizing marijuana. Imagine that you're making a billion dollars every year. What is a billion dollars? That's 450. Today's, in today's Naira, that's 450 billion Naira. If you are that's because for those who Naira sell it, cannabis, it has to be licensed. Why would, you need to be, why would you need to be going to Abuja to share, uh, you know, federal allocation that is like 3 billion Naira per month? It's rubbish. And you have the capability to grow it in Ondo, in the Kitsi, in Delta State, in those states. Just, just let's put our pride and ignorance aside and join the global market and make money for our own good. You can use cannabis for a lot of medicinal things. In fact, some of the medicine we use today, some of them have uh, cannabinoids, uh, uh, you know, oil that can heal your knees if you have injuries. 
uh, you can even use the plant to make a t-shirt. So you can make it, you, they are stronger than cotton. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Indian hemp, why it was called Indian hemp was that the Indians discovered it from rope. Some of the strongest ropes they used to use in those days were made from uh, hemp, the hemp tree, which is a family of uh, cannabis. So in the U.S., when cows used to eat cannabis, uh, I mean hemp, they were stronger than, and better and healthier than when they stopped it. So the criminalization of uh, cannabis was as a result of uh, politics. Cigarettes that is legal is more dangerous than cannabis. It's not even more dangerous, it's destructive. And cannabis is not known to have any side effects except, of course, making people high, you know. But anything can make you high, right? Anything you, any, ex, 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 anything you do in excess can make you high. So, how do you know? How do you know all this? How do you how do you know all this, man? Come on. Knowledge. <laughs> you you see anything you don't know, seek it. Just go and seek the knowledge of things. I I went from one part of the world, my village, where I was a fisherman at the age of nine, ended up in New York City and spent twenty years in the US. I can't oh. come back and be acting like an ignoramus. But I went to school on both sides of the divide. You know, I I, I attended the University of Lagos, I attended uh, Columbia University in New York, one mm -hmm. of the best schools in the U.S. So what the fact that I don't carry these things on, on my face like some people like to do because I'm not the son of somebody doesn't mean that uh, people can, and can come and tell me stories. And I've always asked people, let's debate these issues. Don't just hide behind religion to say things that don't make sense. Don't hide behind some morality, say things that don't make sense. You know, even our parents, they chew tobacco leaves because they want to be high. You know, you heard about snuff. A lot of our parents, they take snuff. I know snuff, yeah, my snuff grandfather. They make you high, too, <laughs> the moment, you know. They make you sneeze clear, and then they make you high. Or go -go uh, the, problem, the problem is the addiction part. So how can the addiction part be contained? Like, I'm, people who are, are selling, are, obviously, I'm it has to be licensed. I'm interested in the medicinal value, not the addiction. We are already dealing with the addiction part. A lot of people... See, cannabis is available in Nigeria, even though it's illegal today. If you want to get real good cannabis, go and talk to NDLA officers. They will send it to you. It's available. In fact, you can get a license to grow cannabis in Nigeria from the NDLA. Officially. Most people don't know these things. Because it's hidden from the public and people are making billions from it. In all those states, people who are buying cannabis illegally out of those states use helicopters to move cannabis out of those states and take them abroad to sell to companies who want them. It's one of the most you know, wanted products in the world right now. Because the world has discovered its usefulness. So the part that you're talking about is, um, is the HTC part, the one that makes you high. You can actually grow hemp without HTC, without the one that makes you high. It's a lot, it has so many values. It has so many uses. You can Google is your best friend in this regard. You don't have to go to university to understand some of these things I'm telling you. And to understand even like countries like even, I think, Syria, uh, uh, you know, I think Thailand or, or Singapore recently, like most countries in the world just recently legalized uh, cannabis because they've all come to the realization that it works. In Israel, cannabis is being used to cure COVID-19. You can Google it. Yes. Okay. Google, because Google, it's, Google. An, it's, it's an anti-inflammatory uh, medicine. Okay, that's that's some um, Escobar movement, but I respect I respect your opinion on cannabis. It's not okay. Escobar, you know, people who want to keep deceiving you will tell you is some kind of uh, drug that you shouldn't go near. But guess what? Most of people who are even saying cannabis is not good, they take cannabis. Pastors, doctors, they use it to relax themselves when they get stressed out. It's also an anti-stress. It is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> so that's that's an interesting one from there. So moving forward, well, Harry, that you are looking at there, go and ask about it. This one is public information. He used to smoke cannabis. He used to smoke cigarettes. This President Buhari, 
tell that she already said it on your show that Buhari used to smoke cigarettes and he used to smoke cannabis. I'm telling you, <laughs> Kasin, I, Dara, where he's from, is the worst place for drug uh, problems in the northern part of Nigeria because of their proximity to Niger Republic. Dara, quote Shore, and I'm here in Abuja. I know they can come and ask me. I will answer them on that. But I said Buhari used to smoke cannabis. He used to okay. smoke cigarettes. Let him those deny are, it. <laughs> those, are, those are questions allocated to you. <laughs> Mr. Shore. Yes. Yeah, yeah, those are, yeah. Okay, those are, those are your questions to answer. Okay. <laughs> so, speaking of it, let's, let's look at something uh, very enlightening. So, can you give us a gist about your social life, your choice of music, movies? Like, what do you do to relax? I, your social you know, life, I don't specifically. A, I don't have much of a social life. Uh, why, why is that? Come on. It's, you know, you, when you develop social life, you start from when you're younger. I started, okay. yeah, as, as, as I've explained to you, I lived a pretty difficult life. You know, I grew up in a village. Uh, you know, we get music once in a while. There's, all, there's a guy with a loudspeaker in the village, he has a generator. If he puts on the music, we all hang around this place and listen. Uh, when I went to the university, when I went to secondary school, I went to secondary school twice in my hometown, Kiribu, and in a place called Okitipupa in Nondo State. And I lived with my uncle, very strict uncle. We used to be, he's a member of CAC. We pray all the time, you know, even though I didn't believe in prayers. You know, I didn't believe in all those church things that they were doing. But they forced us to go to church. We worked very hard. So I went to the university. He has a little bit of uh, social life. But the moment I became a student union activist, you can't risk it. You can't have it both ways. You can't be lax with social life because it will poison your drink, you know, or do something terrible to you, especially under the military. So, well, maybe I will say that the place that I had the most relaxing lifestyle socially was in the u.s and uh because i'll go to clubs and you know uh ah, used to club oh yeah i used to club i, I, used to club. Clubs. I thought you guys yeah. spend most of your time in the library or something <laughs> advocates you guys club i'm just when I, was a student, I, when I was a student in the u.s i i clubbed a lot even before i became a student i go to the club i go watch movies you know <laughs> i like comedies a lot i like documentaries oh uh, there you go. yeah so music, choice of music, you know, I used to do a lot of R and B in those days. But I can't never get away from I get away from, you know, Bob Marley, Fela, everything I did, okay. I come back to those guys. Uh you know, but you know, I was a fan of Whitney Houston, Maria Carey, <laughs> you know. Wait, uh, you? I particularly I was particularly in love with Laurie Hill. Laurie Hill when, when she released the Album is Education of Laurie here. I listen to it every day. It was a period that the Walkman just came out. I bought the Walkman. So, okay. yeah. But these days, I listen to everything. I listen, you know, I listen, to, I still listen to Fella, Bob Marley. I listen to Davido. I listen yeah. to uh, <laughs> Shokuti. Pop, Pop Daddy. Uh, I listen to Faz. You know, Faz, okay. Whiskey. You know, I, I listen to Flavor. Uh, you, know, you, have, uh, you have taste too. Yeah. Yeah, and please. they help me because I, I I run, so I use them for I use them as background music when I'm running as well. Oh, when you're so, running, oh there you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, when so, you're running, so okay. I have to give it to them. I have to give it to them. They, you know, shout out to Faz, the bad guy. And I, and I also make sure that uh, so I have a combination of tastes. You know, I think for me it's the beat that makes the most difference. Music these days don't carry a lot of conscious messages as I, I want them to be. You know, I would, I, I, I would love Nara Mali, for instance. You know, I think he has mannerism, he has, but he's lacking in depth and consciousness, in my view. You know, uh, it's just about, yes, he's singing things that makes people feel good. She can make you, he can make you high, you know, he can make you high, but I think in the long run, if he doesn't move his music away from just fluff, uh, you just have a generation that demand more consciousness. And that's oh, where, yeah. you know, why, for example, I like Nice. You know, when you listen nice. to the depth of the Yoruba <laughs> music, yeah. you know, it has some story to it. I like storytelling in music. Uh, so I, I just, I'm a big fan of Nice. Uh, but I think a lot of them, they start well, they have conscious music, and then they go commercial. The commercial people force them to just do what 
makes money and what is acceptable. Uh, beautiful Nubia is someone I discovered uh, not many years ago, and I found him to be an amazing uh, musician too, a storyteller. Yeah. Uh, with regards to books, I like biographies, uh, and I like history because I've been a teacher. I've been a history teacher for eight years uh, in a university in New York before almost nine, ten years before I came over. Uh, before I ran for office, I quit that job. I didn't quit the job, but they let me kind of go on sabbatical. I nominated somebody to teach the class. And I went to the election, and after election, I didn't go back, and I got arrested, and I'm still in Nigeria a year after. So, wow. so I, I like reading a lot, uh, and I read quite uh, a bit. But, you know, there's, there's, there's a disease in town it's called attention deficit disorder. It's afflicting I all of us. I, yeah, think I, I call it attention deficit disorder. I want to write <laughs> it down. Yeah. That's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of distraction. You can hardly pick a book and finish these days because all that is happening. You get a phone call. You know, you want to check your email, check your WhatsApp, Telegram, yeah. what's happening on Twitter, Facebook. So you don't have a lot of... Uh, your attention span is very thin. It don't used to be like in those days where you can take a book, pick it up, start reading, and you don't drop it. Uh, you don't eat until you finish it. These days, it's tough to cope with all the distractions that's out there. Wow! Like, do you? Know, I literally wrote that attention deficit disorder. I actually wanted to check what else organization whether it's actually a disease. But you, that that's a very good one. A A D D disorder. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, that's the best. It's actually, it's actually a real. It's a real psychological disorder. Okay. That are first kids, attention deficit disorder. Uh, uh, that's just kids who don't pay attention. They have very short attention span, you know. But I think it's uh, it's become like a global phenomenon. <laughs> it's not only kids now; it's affecting everybody. And uh, you know, so I admit to it that sometimes I think. Uh, but sometimes you feel you have substance, even general. <laughs> You just Oof. jumping around because you have <laughs> too much distractions. You know, an average person in this country has two cell phones. Two, you know. Some carry even, you know, uh, some people carry as many as eight phones. I heard that our friend uh, Dele Momodo has a phone assistant. He used to have a phone assistant because they are like maybe twelve <laughs> cell phones. Uh, uh, Hush Puppy has forty-seven cell phones. You can imagine. What is so, that? <laughs> so, <laughs> Attention deficit disorder. I, I like that. I like that. I'll do my research on that. Uh, we hope we find a cure. So speaking of it, we'll still be running out of time. So there are actually some bullet questions to ask you, then we'll wrap it up. So uh, speaking of which, <laughs> attention deficit disorder. Okay, we have 25 seconds. Let me just end this call. Then you, you tune in again, okay? Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you very much. So uh, I, I like the way you were talking about music. You sounded you sounded like a talent manager. <laughs> you sounded like a talent manager. The whole Naramali, and I like your suggestion as you got to Naramali spreading his contents to other factors that could also um, talk about. No, I, I, you know, I actually wanted to. Re I, when I got out of detention, I wanted to see him. Right. I requested to see. He's very influential. Yeah, I wanted to talk to him. Like you know, I don't want him to lose the Malians to fluff. I think okay. the Malians, the people who are following him, who believe in his music and who believe in his presence, could become a fighting force. That is what Bob Mali did. Uh, but but look at what he did in Abuja. Yes, you know. But look, he's not the first person to come with followers. You know, uh, Olamide had the bad, you know, the bados, you know, but. Over time, some talent, new talent will come. It will sing better than he's doing now. And, you know, the Malians will call themselves another name. Uh, and there's a, there are always new generation of Nigerians. But if he can hold tight to the Malians, make them into a republic, like Fela did with uh, Kalakuta Republic, by infusing yeah. and injecting consciousness, you know, and speaking to matters, things that matter to young people, and not shying away from even getting involved in direct action and causes. And he's a rebel now, but he needs to pick up a course. He needs to pick up. That's an advice for Naramali. 
for I'm yeah. sure Ray is possible. So another interesting thing is that I was looking at your um your Instagram page and I see you you do sports, you jog a lot, you've participated in Boston marathon races and New York marathon races. So how is your sports like? Like can you tell us do you play football, basketball, I table tennis? No, I don't I don't play football. I, I do uh, you I support swim. any football I to, club? I used to swim in the university. I used to oh, swim nice. for I actually was part of the university uh the University of Lagos swim swimming team that was supposed to go to uh I think it was the I'll, 19... I'll catch you. It has to be true. Yeah. <laughs> it was supposed to, we were supposed to go to the 1992 Nuga Games. Okay. I was part of the Investor of Lagos swimming team. And uh, we engaged in protests against Babangira and I was expelled. And that was the end of my swimming career. So, but I still swim. I, I grew up... Uh, you probably will see it even on my Instagram or Facebook page. During the election, anytime I go to our village, I go to the lake. To swim, go to the lake. big lake. Uh, but what I do, what I picked up since 2013 is running. I do long distance running, and I've it's done 2013. that since 20 to 2013. Yes, and I've uh, done eight marathons. Eight marathons. Okay. Yes, uh, including New York Marathon, done Lagos, uh, Miami, Philadelphia, and uh, I've done some. Side marathon, uh, upstate New York. So I've done Miami. I think I've done Miami twice, and I've done uh, Philadelphia twice. Done New York once, done Lagos once, and uh, some other ones. So, so we look forward to having a president that will be joining us on marathon. <laughs> no, during the election when we were running in 2019, I challenged uh, the kind the other candidates to not the marathon. I just challenged them to. A 5K, which is uh, five kilometers. Nobody came out, you know, uh, because they were showing Buhari that he walked from somewhere in Kasina, and they were showing it as a sign of health. But Atiku showed a picture of himself on a treadmill, and he said he's strong. I said, we don't need all this uh, show up. Let's just, in Abuja here, meet now. Make we just, I don't even need them to run. Let them walk five kilometers. And if they are still alive, we take it from there. But, you know, the presidency of a country is not necessarily who can run the best, but uh, who can run the system uh, most. Okay, okay. And so, okay. okay. So, okay, speaking of which, now you said a lot about marathon races and running. Uh, you've said a lot about the politics, you've said a lot about the rape cases and whatever, and this is something that interests me and interests Nigerian youth. What's your take on the sports management in terms of athletics, in terms of field events, track events, Olympics participation, Nigeria Football Federation? Like, what's your take on sports? Everything, you know, look, we have so much to give to the sporting world. It's very sad. If we had leadership, uh, sports alone could be fashioned as a lot of uh, uh, forex, foreign exchange. You know, imagine that uh, we are able to participate in every marathon. And each time you participate in a marathon, a Kenyan wins or an Ethiopian. And do you know how much they take home? Nothing less than a million dollars. Just one person. So, and a lot of them participate in marathons across the world, including the Lagos Marathon that the Lagos Marathon is being won by Kenya. On the continent of Africa, whereas we have people in the north who grew up in the same conditions those Kenyans grew up in, who could be doing marathon, but sports development requires that you start with people when they are very young. You know, it's not possible for me to start marathon at the age of 42 and win a marathon. It would be a miracle. For you to win a marathon, you must have started at the age of 10 running long distance, right? So, and that's what you see with countries who understand the value of sports. Sports has the commercial value. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that you cannot leave in the hands of people who don't even know what they're doing. If you look, go to the Lagos Marathon, the organizers of the Lagos Marathon cannot run one kilometer. They can't. How can you expect people like that to understand and organize a proper marathon? <laughs> There should be a marathon in every major city in this country. There should be 
you may, Nigeria should be producing some of the best swimmers from the Niger Delta region, you know, such that one swimmer can make more money than, you know, a thousand militants. <laughs> you understand? So if you can make money from swimming, if you win a good medal from swimming, if you make more money than militants, why won't the militants want to learn how to swim? So we also see what we are doing with soccer. We can do volleyball. But you have to invest in sports for it to produce the results that will bring you glory and wealth. We don't have that. You see, you need foresight. Sports is something that requires a lot of planning and foresight. You build them into educational curricula. You just don't wake up and say, oh, we want to go and win the good medal in 100 meters. You must have decided on people who are going to win the 20, right? The 20 taxi marathon. America is already preparing for it. Japan is already preparing for it. The UK is already preparing for it. We, we want to prepare for the Olympics. Two weeks before the Olympics, we start looking for people around the world who are Nigerians, figuring out how, you know. That was how, I, I think, uh, was it 2014 or so? or 2018, the last Olympics, Nigeria took uh, people to play basketball for Nigeria. Oh, and the guys have never been to Nigeria Olympics. before. Yes. 12 Olympics. Nigeria versus USA. A lot of them don't. They have never been to Nigeria before. 153 to 78. They just, they just took passports to them, Nigerian passports. They say, okay, wait in your house. We'll come and give you a passport. We took a lot of kids from Texas. And, you know, this was, they were... Kids who were Nigerian parents, you know, parentage. But imagine if we had been developing our basketball game at home, developing swimming, cycling, you know, running. But look at the whole of Nigeria, 200 million people. How many stadiums do you have <laughs> in the whole country? You can't boast of, you can't boast of 10 that's, that can, you know, that you can call a stadium. Right? So it requires investment, foresight, it requires planning. You don't have that. You just have people, all the people in the sporting sector, they are fire brigadiers. Whenever there is sports, a competition, they start arranging. You know, uh, there was a time we were going to Brazil to play soccer. Our uh, players were stuck in Atlanta. It was Delta Air that eventually gave 20, them. Yeah, 2016 yeah. Olympics. Those, even one of the players, John Mikel Obi, had to use his own personal funds. The person they gave the money to has embezzled the money. It's a disgrace. <laughs> we always disgrace now. So there was a year in this country, most people weren't born then, uh, that um, we were supposed to play at the National Stadium. And the shots for the players, the Super Eagles, the person who had the shots was not available. <laughs> they had to use scissors to cut the, it is what the, it is <laughs> the pants they had to use scissors we saw it there's nothing we haven't seen in this country man <laughs> there's nothing we haven't seen in this country it's a sham it's a sham but with planning with the right kind of leadership managers you know I, like I told you look at the US the, the, the way the US is is like it's almost like a sporting nation the sporting seasons, you know, American football, you know, uh, uh, basketball, soccer, everything. My son Baseball, is yeah. going to be about 10 years old. He's already a member of a, a soccer team. You know, they're already grooming him to play soccer in the future if he wants to. He gives scholarship to people who can play sports so that they can go to school and at the same time bring wealth and glory to their country. It's a big deal if we have the right leaders here. But it, we don't. We don't. And it's, you, can't, you can't get anything from the present crop of leaders. They don't know what to do about it. They don't understand sports. They don't understand anything. Okay. I, will, I, will, I have my reservation on that. So speaking of which, thank you for your contribution, your sports competition, uh, contribution. I'm a fan of sports, so... Uh, I give you maximum 101% maximum rotation of sports. So, uh, speaking of which, so I have this interesting question. What What's your take on the social media bill that was trending a couple of weeks ago? It's dead on arrival. I don't need to have any take on it. I went to the National Assembly and I told them that the bill is dead on arrival. Uh, it's, it's not going to work. 
not going to work. So uh, that's, that's actually the shortest answer you've given me on that. So how are you coping with the restriction of movement? How do you stay in touch with your family? How does your family stay in touch with you? You know, like, it's, how, uh, how you it's, with I'm, a, I'm a digital father and husband. So Ooh. I relate with my president and my family, you know, uh, via the digital world. So we're in touch. You know, restriction is, uh, is what you make of it. You know, if you don't feel restricted, nobody can restrict you. Uh, even when I was in detention, I didn't feel restricted. Even though I was in um, isolation, I didn't feel restricted. And each time they come around and see that I don't feel restricted, it hurts them really bad. It makes them feel upset. Um, but I don't want to pay attention to the restriction. The restriction is their own restriction. The case is their own case. I'm not the one on trial. They're the ones on trial. And I'm glad that young people are starting to get into, you know, the conversation about the future very early. But I hope we sustain it. I hope we sustain it because it's not enough to just talk about it. We have to do something about the future. And we have to start now. You said a lot. And that leads me to my personal question. And generally personal question because we're, we're out of time. And I want to appreciate your, I want to say thank you for your contributions on today's show. So to end this on an optimistic note, what is the Nigeria of your dream? I don't have a Nigeria of my dream because I don't sleep. You know? You <laughs> yes. As a, uh, as a punchline. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't do the daydreaming anymore. Nigeria has reached, we've reached a point where we can't be talking about Nigeria of our dream. You know, the Nigeria we want is going to be, the Nigeria that I'm looking for is Nigeria of my will. That's all. Nigeria you know, will. we can only get Nigeria we want through willpower, not by sleeping. So we should stop sleeping because We've been sleeping for too long. We're sleeping for close to 60 years. And dreaming, daydreaming, night dreaming. We're talking about this Nigeria of our dream for too long, you know. It's time to get Nigeria of our will. Nigeria of our will. Yes. Willpower. Willpower. Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, with all due respect, are you aware of this current trend of the comedian Josh Tufoni? You just say what is the business? Yeah, Josh Tufoni. Think about it. I see a guy. I see a guy on Facebook. He has a the, the one that wears like Jalabia and uh, he, he, he plays different character. He's he's yeah. Um, this current "Don't Leave Me" challenge, whereby he makes some punchlines and it makes sense out of something. I you know I think I've seen something about just people. I I follow comedy a lot. I follow a lot of skits on um, okay on on Facebook in particular. And, uh, okay. you know, I have my favorites. I like Mr. Macaroni. Oh! <laughs> yeah, I kind of like him. Okay. That's nice. Uh, That's nice. I like Sha uh, What's uh, the other guy? Brother Shaggy. Is that Brother Shaggy? Brother Shaggy in the beer. Yeah, yeah. I like uh, there are a lot of creative Nigerians. It's, yeah. it's very funny, creative, and they're addressing social issues with comedy. Uh, and I think that's what comedy ought to be. And uh, so I'm seeing a lot of that. Uh, but I think I've seen Josh Too Funny uh, yeah. on Facebook. I must have come across that. But now that you've spoken about it, uh, I will go look for him. Yeah, you should check out Josh Too Funny. If you had seen Josh Too Funny, I just wanted to play, uh, to, to just do a short punchline of his jokes. Like, he makes... He plays with words, English words. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, it's trending. It's actually very, it's trending in the society. Uh, okay, you mentioned something that I forgot to ask you a question on, but I need to ask you a question on that. You said you, you taught for eight years. You were a teacher for eight, eight years. Yes. yes. Like so a university time, teacher. They call us professors. Yes. Professors, Not okay. In the US, yes. But yes. here, when you call somebody a professor, it's somebody who has a PhD and, yes, uh, yes. for too long. So, but in the U.S., every teacher, every university teacher, what they call college teacher, is referred to as a professor. So I'm an adjunct professor. 
adjunct means part-time professor or uh, part-time what you call part-time lecturer so i teach post-colonial africa history uh at uh, the school of visual arts in new york i've done it for uh i did it for eight nine years before i left it to go do politics and of course that's on the side, doing it side by side with running Sahara Reporters, which I've uh, done since 2006. Okay, okay, that's right. So now, your experience as a professor, how, how would the educational system be better handled in times like this? Because schools were, were, schools were shut down, and it's a backward step for the Nigeria educational system. You see, when I, was running, when I was running for president, I mentioned is that uh, I said it somewhere, and I keep looking for the footage. I think I must have said that in Germany because I traveled extensively both within Nigeria and outside to the diaspora. And uh, that the idea of a classroom will soon become a thing of the past. Just like I said that oil, as we know it now, good oil is a lazy economy. Just like I spoke about cannabis becoming a commercial uh, product, a medicinal thing that we can export, people laugh at me. They laughed at me in those days. I didn't know that less than two years after I said all these things, they would come to pass. Uh, uh, and with regards to being a professor, I could, I could now teach even from Nigeria. I could teach my class from Nigeria if I want to go back because of technology. But, you know, to have technology that teach people, uh, you have to put the social infrastructure in place. And you have to understand the technology behind, you know, using technology for education. Uh, and we don't have that, uh, we don't have that plan here, you know, and it's going to rob us of years of uh, uh, education and literacy for our kids. Uh, what we need to start doing now, or we should have done a long time ago, is to put infrastructure in place. Look at Zoom. I have a Zoom platform here that can take 100 people. That means every university in Nigeria now should be teaching their classes from home through Zoom. You know, uh, but you can't teach somebody with Zoom when you have the most expensive. Uh, uh, data payment in the country. I'm talking about uh, your credit for internet. Our internet is the most expensive in the world. I've been, I've been saying this for a long time. You have to make provision for it. You have to have an internet backbone that supports the education system. A lot of universities don't even have functioning websites. When I say functioning website, websites that you have students can log in you know, have emails, interact. They don't have it. A lot of, uh, you know, the universities don't even have internet on campus. The other day, the president of Nigeria was supposed to participate in a UN program. The internet in his office was too weak. If Astro Rock cannot connect to UN for, for a virtual meeting, how can the universities do that? So we need a country that is serious about this, all this. And uh, part of it is also that the wrong people they put in these agencies, you know, uh, okay. who don't understand how these things work is also part of the big problem. So we have to fix that. We have to make sure that any, every Nigeria has its own internet backbone okay. to support virtual education because okay. that's yeah. the future of education, you know. It's not only advantageous for Nigeria, but we are entering into very soon an era of virtual education, global virtual education, in which case, if we get it right, if we do it right, our kids who are in primary school here can join primary schools in, the, in London, in America, secondary schools in London, and have the same quality of education through virtual technology or through digital technology. But you need people who understand these technological uh, advancements to be able to deploy them for education. We don't, I don't think our people are capable of doing that. All these yes. people you see around here are just selling recharge cards. <laughs> and connecting so with phone companies to rip our people off. 
So okay. if you buy a thousand naira data now, it can't carry you even through the day. Sometimes they, it's, it's just it's just it's insane. A, it's a it's shame. Just, yeah, yeah. I I am sure. Shout out to I am sure. He's saying something about uh, broadband accessibility, a right to all Nigerians. Yes, you know I said it when I was running that um, apart from free education. Uh, I will add internet to one of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Internet will become a human right. Internet connection. In which case, you don't have to pay through your notes to get connected to the internet. And this is a way you can help commerce, you can help education, you can facilitate a lot of things. You know, you can get you get get farmers connected to cities, and they can transport food to us. These days, even in this Abuja, you can order food online. It's been happening for a long time, right? But you can make it happen in the whole country. You can transport blood from Abuja to a village in Zamfara with a drone. They are doing it in Ghana. They call it zip lines. And we the other day, some... they are celebrating uh, robots at the airport, I think, three days ago. Rwanda already bought those robots, and they are using them in Rwanda as of a month ago. And you so... go and find out how much we bought each of our own. It will, cost, it will probably be the same amount as an, air, an aircraft. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, quick one. So, speaking about internet, how was your reaction when you heard about the 5G theory? Of this COVID nineteen, <laughs> I was just laughing. I knew the, you know, it's our people love conspiracy, and I think one of the things that COVID did is expose a lot of people who we thought had who, who most people thought had common sense. And it, taught, it taught a lot of people that common sense is not even common. The only country that did not have COVID that was Malawi. They've deployed 5G, I think, as soon as 5G came out. And they have the lowest infection rate. You know, but when you see ignoramuses like Dino Melai, all those pastors talking about uh, 5G. And when that uh, theory was disproved, they moved to other things. They are talk now they're talking about chips implanted into human bodies. It's rubbish. You know, it's, it's very sad. But it's part of what happens to people who don't worship their own gods. <laughs> it is what it is. Last, yeah. last, last. How did you come up with Sahara reporters? Like, even the name Sahara, like, that's, that's, it that's, came that's, from that's, that's, as a, as a, as a graduate of geography, I've always been fascinated with the Sahara Desert. It was, it was one of the first things I heard about when I was studying geography, even in primary school. And I've always wondered what the Sahara Desert is like. It's, you know, it's, it's like it overshadows everything in Africa. You know, they even call a good chunk of Africa Sub-Sahara Africa, you know. Sub-Sahara so, Africa. Um, when I had to set up, I used to work with a guy who named his internet platform after his last name, Elendo Report. We used to, we started Elendo Report. So when I broke away from this guy, I was thinking, I don't want to set up a platform called Shawara Reports. It's tacky to me. So what came to my mind is Sahara Desert. And reporters, for me, Sahara Reporters is the guy who is <coughs> trying best to find to the right reports in the most difficult place in the world, which is Sahara. Like, as soon as you take a step, you know, they'll throw sand up, you know, and then you have to be struggling through it. Or that was where the idea, that was the idea. It's like the difficulty of practicing my trade in the most difficult place and without, you know, experience. Because it doesn't matter what experience you have, it's difficult to navigate the Sahara Desert. It's, it's an unpredictable place to move mm -hmm. and operate in. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good one. Okay. I, I like the history and the initiative behind the story of Sahara reporters. So last but not the least, the movement you speak of, what kind of support do you need? It's for everybody to, everybody to be a person, man. 
I want, I really want young people to to step up, to step up and not to be afraid and to just say, look, enough is enough. And let's all bond together. Behave like the Malay. You know, we just heard about, I just spoke about Malawi. And they tried to, they tried to do election. Their president rigged the election. The people came out in mass. The police tried to shoot at them. When the army saw that they were determined, the army came and protected them, and now they have a new president, a new president-elect. Mali had a mass protest last two weeks in Mali. So we need to do something about our situation, our situation here in Nigeria, and I think we just need young people to move and bond together. And uh, for everybody to be an activist, don't be ashamed to be it, because that is what is needed at this time, for everybody to be actively engaged in fighting oppression. Otherwise, uh, it will be a disaster. If this country continues like this, it will be unsustainable so and unpredictable what the future might give. And I say that to even people who are agitating and advocating for a breakup of Nigeria. You can't break up Nigeria without, fight, without a fight. It's not possible because the people who are, who are vested interest in the United Nigeria is their social security, is their place of profit, they will fight back. So the most peaceful way to move Nigeria into an era of progress and prosperity is a revolutionary movement that jettisons push out all this system of oppression and reformation that takes us nowhere. And young people can do it because our population is 75% of the population of this country. You do your calculation. What is 75% of 200 million people? What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? Why are we like this? Why are we so lazy? Why are we so afraid? Why can't we just join hands together and end our misery all at once? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Omoyele Shorobe. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I wish you everything for the best in everything you put your hands into. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for your opinions. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for tuning in to It Is What It Is with Johnny OG. Yeah, you have a good rest. All right, Johnny. Yeah. Have a good night. And uh, I say revolution now to all our friends. I can see them all with the all over the <laughs> platform. Take it back. Right, it is what it is. Yeah, have a good night, rest. Yeah, right. Good night.